I'm a research associate at the Friedrich Nisser Institute since 2016. And we work um, on all types of uh, transcriptomic and epigenomic data in collaboration with uh, experimental labs here. And so um, in that capacity, that gives us the opportunity um, to uh, not only focus on different biological problems, but also to test different latest developments um, in the field of computational biology um, and see how well these apply in, in real world problems that are tackled here in the Institute. So today I'd like to um, uh, talk to you about um, how deep learning applies to uh, transcriptomics and specifically to single cell transcriptomics. And so I will first start with uh, um, a very brief overview of single cell transcriptomics, um, the different uh, problems that come with uh, the specific data that are generated uh, from single cell RNA sequencing, but also the different opportunities that we get from this data. And hopefully this will give you an inspiration about um, why deep learning can be actually uh, an ideal approach um, for tackling some of these issues, but also um, for the different types of analysis that uh, are coupled with, uh, with these types of data sets. Then I'll move to um, uh, the autoencoders that uh, historically was actually the first model that was applied to single transcriptomics. You heard um, a few things in the morning, so I'm not going to go um, into too much detail there. But this will also give me the opportunity to introduce representation codes. That is a very important concept um, in the deep learning applications in, in transcriptomics, well, in deep learning applications in general, but also in transcriptomics. Uh, then I'll move to uh, some uh, common uh, architectures that are used in uh, single cell transcriptomics, uh, which are of the deep generative network types, and specifically, I'm going to talk about variational autoencoders and uh, adversarial networks. And finally, I'm going to talk about different applications of single cell omics, existing tools, uh, which by necessity is not going to be a comprehensive list. And I will finish up with some perspectives of where um, we think um, the field is moving and what are some challenges in the future. So um, a very broad introduction to single cell transcriptomics. Uh, I'm sure that uh, pretty much all of you uh, have either some hands-on experience or you have heard some things about um, a single cell RNA sequencing, but the main uh, advantage, the main opportunities that come uh, with uh, single cell RNA seq as opposed to bulk RNA sequencing is that you have the ability to probe the transcriptional output of individual cells as opposed to uh, getting uh, an average view of the whole cell population. And this gives unprecedented opportunities as compared to the bulk uh, technologies. It gives you the ability to uh, probe the population structure, uh, to look um, in detail the cell heterogen heterogeneity uh, structure of your population. It gives you the ability to, um, to study the dynamics of your population and to study the gene distribution characteristics of your population, which uh, again, all of these tasks were uh, either completely impossible or, or at the very least not straightforward at all to do um, when using bulk rna technologies. A typical uh, single cell rna workflow uh, starts with uh, cell dissociation, uh, where you basically try to um, um, to uh, move apart the cells that you want to assay. Uh, and then you have to isolate the cells. And depending on the technology, the specific technology that you use, there are many ways in which you can do that. Um, but by far, the most uh, common technique that you use is the isolation of cells uh, by um, encapsulation in droplets, uh, which is also known as uh, microfluidics. So basically what happens there is that um, you, uh, you end up with, uh, with uh, uh, small droplets that contains hopefully uh, only one cell, although there are cases where you can have in the same, the same droplet uh, multiplets of cells. Uh, and these same droplets also contain all the necessary chemicals that 
you need in order to um, perform library construction. So necessary chemicals that you need in order to, to do your reverse transcription, uh, to get your cDNA and the amplification of, uh, of the cDNA. Um, and this uh, procedure is shown here. Uh, and also during library construction, construction typically you also incorporate in your, uh, in your cDNA molecules, the amplified cDNA molecules, different barcodes uh, that, are, that can be extremely useful for different tasks. So for example, you have sample barcodes that can be used in order to demultiplex um, uh, your samples in, in cases where you have uh, at the same type uh, uh, assays of, of, uh, of different experiments, for example. You have barcodes for the individual cells, which uh, give you the ability to tell if a particular uh, uh, molecule comes from a specific cell. And also typically um, you have barcodes that uh, are called unique molecular identifiers that give you the ability to tell whether a particular um, a molecule that you're look looking at is actually coming from an original unique transcript or is the result of uh, perhaps over amplification uh, of the same molecule. Typically after all these processes are done, what you end up with is basically uh, a huge count matrix where you have, uh, depending on, on how you view it, but uh, you can have in the rows your features, which are uh, essentially your genes. And uh, the columns correspond to the different cells. So these count matrices are the, the input point of all the analysis. And the first uh, task that you have to, to do are different types of quality control. Uh, where uh, you filter you filter out cells of low quality or genes that are non-inform non completely non-informative. You have to uh, normalize your data. You have to uh, uh, often correct your data for uh, technical batches, which we'll talk also about later. You have to select features. That means genes that are uh, particularly informative in terms of dissecting the biological heterogeneity of your samples. And after that come the downstream um, analysis where you can visualize the, your cells. You can um, study the heterogeneity by, for example, clustering your cells or performing comp composition analysis to look at what are the levels of gene expression uh, in different parts of your population. Um, you can try to uh, annotate your clusters. And also in cases where you're looking at uh, cell populations that are dynamic in nature, you can um, have specific types of analysis that are uh, targeted to study the dynamics of that population. So for example, you can have trajectory inference tasks. You can try to uh, dissect the metastable states of your population. You can study the gene expression dynamics. And finally, you can have um, analyses that are targeting specifically the, the genes of the population. So you, perform, you can perform differential expression analysis, for example, between different subpopulations of your complete population. You can perform gene set enrichment analysis, or um, you can uh, try to infer gene regulatory networks uh, based on uh, the distribution characteristics of your genes in uh, the population that you're looking at. If we wanted to, maybe to, to, to give, to summarize in one sentence, what is the key characteristic of, of uh, single cell data, then that sentence would be that um, single cell data sets uh, contain, are the result of multiple and often confounded sources of variance. Uh, what I mean by that is that um, the end result that you're looking at, the, the, um, uh, the, the particular profile of cells that you're looking at, in terms of the gene counts are the results of multiple signals. Part of the signals can be biological. For example, it can be the cell type heterogeneity of your sample, it can be genetics, it can be the specific uh, cell state or microenvironment of a cell, uh, it can be gene expression, stochasticity, uh, cell cycle dynamics, um, uh, other types of oscillatory behaviors of the cells and so on. But at the same time, you, you have different uh, technical sources of variance. Um, which, of, which, for example, can come for a different capture efficiency of your experiment, different amplification biases, PCR artifacts, contaminations, cell doublets, 
uh, damage cells, sampling effects, and so on. And uh, all, all together, these, these effects give rise to a particular profile that, uh, a particular, sorry, typical profile that I show here. So if you look at two cells of a, of a, of a typical um, single cell RNA sequencing experiment, even if those two cells are of the same type, you usually get uh, this type of picture that for people that are used to looking at bulk RNA sequencing data is, is of, of a completely different uh, type in the sense that you have uh, an overall uh, lower correlation between your cells uh, as opposed to, to, to different, to do uh, bulk populations of, of the same type. You have a uh, dropout and by dropouts, I mean, um, gene features that are measured in one cell and they give you uh, counts in one, in one cell, but not in another. You have over dispersed genes. That means uh, genes that appear to have a, a much higher variance than what you would expect just because of sampling. And you also get high magnitude outliers. And again, these outliers uh, can be because of technical reasons or um, it could also be because of biological reasons. And a very uh, common problem with uh, single cell data sets are the very strong uh, batch effects that I mentioned earlier. And I mentioned this because this is also one of the applications of, uh, of uh, deep learning, uh, the correction of, of, of batch effects. So batch effects are caused by the technical source of variation that are introduced in the data set during handling uh, uh, and, and, and preparation of your samples. They're essentially distortion signals with different characteristics uh, in terms of their intensity and variance that are applied to each technical batch. And this distortion can have different effects on each of the features of your, of your data set, on each of the genes. In the case of single cell sequencing, the distortions can also have different effects on distinct, on distinct cells of, uh, of your population, which means that this, this uh, variance is also confounded with biology because um, uh, typically batch populations are not identical in composition. And because single cell sequencing involves more and more complex steps compared to, to bulk RNA sequencing, uh, the batch effects uh, that are introduced uh, are, are typically um, much exaggerated. Okay, so now I will switch gears and uh, talk a little bit about autoencoders, which as I mentioned, were the, historically the first deep learning models that were uh, applied to single cell transcriptomics. And I will um, also introduce a presentation code. And then I will talk about um, uh, variational autoencoder and um, the adversarial networks. So you heard a uh, few things uh, during the morning session about uh, autoencoders. So I'll give um, uh, a brief summary. Um, so autoencoders are, are supervised models. Um, you don't need labeled data sets um, in order to train those models, which means that you also have easy access to large uh, training sets. The objective uh, of an autoencoder is basically to obtain uh, an output that matches um, quite closely uh, your original input. But you do this in a particular way. And the way that you do this is by squeezing your data through successive layers of decreasing, of decreasing dimensions. So essentially what you're doing is that as you move from one layer to the other in the encoder and to layers of, of decreasing dimensions, you are compressing your data. And hopefully what you're doing through, um, throughout this procedure is that you are maintaining the most salient features, that is the most important features of your original data set. The middle layer, uh, so um, uh, what you end up after you go through the encoder is, is a code, is a latent code um, that represents again, the most salient features of your input. So you have two components in this autoencoder. You have the encoder that is the, the part of the machine that performs the compression and the decoder that performs the, de the, the, the decompression of, of uh, 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 the latent code. And the way that you uh, 
try to, uh, to estimate the weights for this model is by uh, using a reconstruction loss, which is basically uh, a way to quantify the difference between your input and your output. So that's it, it's very simple. There are of course multiple um, flavors of autoencoders. So you have deep stacked uh, autoencoders, sparse variational autoencoders that we'll talk about in more detail later, denoising autoencoders, adversarial disentangled and, and, and so on. But um, the, the, the main principle, these are, these are small variations uh, of the main theme, of the same theme that uh, I just talked about. Um, historically, there have been many different applications of, uh, of autoencoders. So um, autoencoders have been used for dimensionality reduction and visualization, um, for denoising and image completion, um, for feature manipulation, uh, interpolation, and extrapolation. And I saw some examples here, uh, mainly from the field of, of uh, image processing. However, these, uh, these applications on, on image processing have actually um, very close correspondence to the, to the problems that we face in, in single cell transcriptomics. What is the connection here? So uh, as in, in, in many cases in, uh, in image analysis, uh, transcriptomic data are high dimensional. Uh, they can be extremely noisy as I mentioned earlier and, and uh, they can have uh, corruptions, which means that on one hand we have a, a need uh, for uh, techniques that will give us the ability to uh, perform efficiently dimensionality reduction on this data. And on the other hand, of techniques that will allow us to do uh, 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 denoising or imputation on our transcriptomic data sets. They have uh, very complex feature relationships, so that so the relationships between the genes uh, are, uh, are not uh, easy to model. And finally, the, the sources of variance that I, that I described earlier have effects on our data that can be highly nonlinear which means again that it's not at all straightforward to model the effects of the sources of variance um, using um, traditional um, um, machine learning approaches. I mentioned earlier that uh, one of the more, most common architectures that is used in, in uh, uh, single cell transcriptomics is actually a variation of autoencoders, which I would like to introduce here. And these are the variational autoencoders. You also uh, had um, a brief introduction of them in the morning, but uh, again, I'll give you a reminder. So variational autoencoders generalize uh, autoencoders by adding uh, stochasticity to our model. Uh, the latent layer, instead of now being point estimates, they actually now, it now actually represents distributions. And uh, what are the advantages of using a variational autoencoder as opposed to a traditional autoencoder? Well, first, it encourages a, a continuous latent manifold. Uh, that means it encourages uh, an embedding that has um, no uh, breaking points between, uh, uh, between the different um, uh, parts of the, of the data set that you're trying to represent. It gives more robust models and also um, it encourages valid decodings, which is not always the case for a traditional autoencoder. And perhaps most importantly, it allows interpolation and exploration uh, because it sits on a, on a very solid um, um, uh, statistical frame, uh, statistical inference framework. Um, what is the difference in terms of the of the loss function that you use in order to train those models? So you still have a reconstruction loss, which is um, the same that you use for a traditional autoencoder. So this measures the difference between your input and the output, but you have an additional loss term, which quantifies uh, the distance to a latent prior, to a latent prior distribution. And this latent prior distribution, distribution is uh, a multivariate normal distribution with a unit covariate matrix, meaning that it assumes independence between uh, uh, the different um, uh, latent nodes. You can see here that uh, um, there is a beta parameter in this, um, in this um, penalization term, is this uh, distance to the latent prior. And this is actually a tunable hyperparameter, 
So when this beta is equal to one, then um, this whole penalty is also known as a evidence lower bound. And this is the standard, the vanilla variation of the encoder. However, you can have beta values that are less than one, which um, gives rise to partially regularized uh, variation of the encoder. And basically what you do by, by setting the beta value to, to lower values is to encourage um, uh, the model to have um, a, a better reconstruction uh, performance uh, because this part is now uh, toned down. You can also have beta values that are greater than one, than one and this gives a rise to the beta variation autoencoders or disentangling autoencoders. Um, and uh, this actually uh, encourages models um, that um, give rise to, to, uh, um, to later nodes that are, um, 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 that are more uh, independent to each other. And the reason for that is because you are encouraging models that are closer to your prior, to the, um, to the multivariate normal with the unit covariance metric, which again assumes independence between the later nodes. A second common architecture in, in, in single central transcriptomics, again, you heard a, a few things about this in the morning, are generative adversarial networks. And these are machines that have basically two components. So first, you have uh, a generator that gives um, uh, rise to uh, fake samples, basically. And then you have a discriminator whose task is to try to tell whether the, the, um, the samples that you, that you get from the generator uh, are actually um, uh, real samples or not. And the way that you try to, uh, to estimate uh, the weights of, of, uh, of, uh, of this model is by actually trying to get a machine that, that minimizes the performance of the discriminator. That is not basically a machine that is not able to tell a real sample from the samples that are generated, the fake samples that are generated from the, from the generator. So in the first stages of the training, you might have uh, a distribution of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the generator that is far away from uh, the, the real sample distribution. But as you progress to training, these distributions um, approach each other more and more, and hopefully, uh, by the end of the training, you end up with a generator that gives rise um, to a manifold that is extremely similar to the real sample um, manifold. Generative adversarial networks have notoriously unstable training dynamics. Um, however, there are uh, ways to overcome this uh, and suffer from what is known as, as mode collapse, which leads to some nodes of to some modes of the data being. Uh, overrepresented and others are uh, completely missing. However, uh, they are able to generate very, very highly realistic fake samples. So they're also uh, very commonly used in single cell transcriptomics, for example, in cases where you want to generate samples that very um, closely resemble uh, a real transcriptomic samples. For example, in cases where you want to do uh, data augmentation. Um, it doesn't. Uh, uh, um, it doesn't really matter which, which, um, or other, um, um, what, whichever type of, of model you, you use. There is a there is a common underlying goal um, um, in 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 the in the cases where you use um, deep learning models, and this goal is to obtain a good uh, code representation of the input data. Uh, and what does uh, a good representation mean can sometimes um, depend on the particular goal that you have in mind. However, there are some, some um, commonalities in terms of what a good representation uh, has in terms of characteristics. So first, it has to be robust to meaningless input corruption. Input corruption. That, mean, that means that it is um, a representation that is robust in the presence of, of uh, noise. It has to be generalizable. That means that um, it should um, ideally transfer to multiple settings and to multiple related problems. It should be smooth and coherent. That means uh, that for similar inputs, you should get a similar code output. And ideally, it should also be explanatory. That means uh, if you have different sources of uh, distinct sources of variance uh, that give rise to your data, 
ideally you would want your representation code um, to also disentangle these sources of variance. So to have um, uh, different nodes, for example, for example uh, encapsulating um, the different distinct type of, of variance that give rise to the data. What does this mean uh, in practice in terms of, of uh, transcriptomics? What is the um, interpretation of, of uh, a representation code uh, when we're talking about, um, about transcriptomics? Um, a, a, a representation code, a latent code in terms of transcriptomics is basically a succinct generative representation of complex transcriptomic manifolds. That means that each location in this manifold represents a different realizable cell state. Okay, so, so there is, there is a, a, a very direct uh, relationship between the representation code that, code that you get from a deep learning model and um, uh, the way that the data are generated uh, to give a particular uh, transcriptomic uh, profile output. And a useful analogy that, that, um, that um, I, I always keep in mind and I think might be also useful in terms of, of drawing this connection is the Waddington landscape, which is uh, a concept that is known to uh, biologists since many, many decades ago, which is basically an abstraction for people that are working typically in, in differentiation or developmental biology that views these cells as a, as a ball uh, in, a, in a high dimensional landscape, a high dimensional manifold. And this ball can actually move through, through this landscape and every position in this landscape basically represents a different cell, cell state. So for example, when you go uh, through uh, differentiation or through reprogramming, uh, this uh, ball moves and jumps to different cell states. And so you can view the, the later representation uh, of a deep learning model as, as a realization of this um, um, ideal abstraction that the biologists have had in mind since, in, uh, since many decades. Okay, uh, are there any questions so far before I, before I move to the last slides talking about specific applications? There was a question more on the, um, uh, how are the generated single cell transcriptomics data used? So if you have some examples of how, how to do this. Some examples of, of how to generate them. Um, no, how, yeah, I think it's more how to encode or how to use the data from transcriptome single cell, I think is, uh, well, maybe Katarina can uh, speak up if this is the question. If you're talking about pre-processing, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but if you're talking about pre-processing, there is minimal need for pre-processing of the data. Um, so uh, typically you don't need to do any feature selection because as, you, as you've heard earlier, deep learning models are end-to-end. -end, uh, so there's no real need for feature selection, maybe uh, with the exception of, of doing this in order to reduce um, uh, the, um, the, the computational time for training your model. Um, there's also little need uh, for um, um, transformation of the data. And typically people uh, log transform the data before using them as input to, to deep learning models. And the reason for this is, is um, uh, to make the, the training landscape a little bit smoother so that you don't end up with, uh, um, um, uh, with a model with um, um, very hard to estimate weights. If you try to bring um, your input data um, in, in, uh, in terms of the features in, in a similar scale. Um, but that's pretty much it, if that was the question. Her, her microphone is not working, but I think that she, you, Katanini, can also rephrase if it was not that what you're looking for. While in me, the meanwhile, there's a, there are other two questions. How are these models validated experimentally? Um, that depends again on, on uh, exactly what, uh, um, what the goal is. So, um, uh, first of all, uh, like I said, um, autoencoders are unsupervised, so, so there is an, an internal uh, control of how well these data perform in terms of um, how well are they able to reconstruct uh, your input data sets. Um, uh, you can also um, try to see how well they impute data 
for example, with, with um, uh, common techniques uh, of, of, uh, of validation, so for example, by uh, holding back a part of your data set and look how well it represents the, um, uh, the validation set that was never used for training. Um, uh, but again, it, it really depends on exactly what you're trying to do in terms of, of uh, validation. And maybe this, some of these things will become clear in, in specific examples. So a very common um, uh, application is dimensionality reduction, uh, data visualization and, and clustering. This is a very natural application of, of uh, um, variational autoencoders or, or autoencoders, uh, because uh, as we mentioned earlier, the, the latent layer is actually um, um, a, a compressed representation of your data. That means that you have already performed dimensionality reduction and you can use this latent encoding to efficiently uh, visualize your, your data with your favorite uh, technique of, of uh, uh, 2D embedding like Disney or, or UMAP. And you can also very succinctly represent uh, every cell by, um, its, um, uh, by, the, by its latent encoding. Okay. Uh, you can also use this uh, uh, compressed uh, latent layer, this reduced representation, as the input for clustering methods. Uh, or you can even use this latent representation, for example, in cases where you're studying um, dynamics of your cells and you try to reconstruct uh, the trajectories of your, of your population. So um, instead of going through techniques of, of uh, feature selection, you can uh, uh, use this uh, latent encoding for, for these tasks. A very, uh, another very natural um, application is imputation and denoising. So as mentioned earlier, the output of the decoder is uh, essentially a denoised uh, uh, version of your input data. So uh, what you get back in this uh, last layer of the, of the encoder is essentially a, a, a denoised version of your original data set. There are several um, applications of, uh, um, with small variations of uh, autoencoders and variational encoders that uh, actually perform imputation and denoising. And here I show an example uh, from actually in-house generated data uh, from retina, where you can see the original relationship between two uh, retinal cells, uh, where you see this typical picture of, of high magnet outliers and, and dropouts between the cells. And you can see how the same data look like uh, after you have gone through the steps uh, of, uh, of denoising. Um, and on the bottom here, what you see is the effect that um, um, uh, denoising with, with uh, a, a variational encoder has on the mean variance relationship um, uh, that you typically see in single cell data sets. So uh, typically um, you have this uh, very particular relationship with, where as you move to higher and higher levels of expression, um, the, the variation of the cells when this is normalized for gene expression becomes lower and lower. And this is basically a, an effect of, of uh, it's a sampling effect. So typically it follows uh, very closely uh, the Poisson distribution or is a little bit over dispersed compared to a Poisson distribution. On the right, you can see um, the same um, mean to variance relationship, but on the decoded output. And you can see that this uh, association between gene expression and variance is now completely lost, which means basically that your, the autoencoder has corrected uh, for the sampling uh, effects, um, meaning that it's also a uh, much more straightforward um, uh, to model your genes, for example, in tasks of uh, differential gene expression or for tasks of, uh, of genes that are uh, markets for particular subpopulation of your data set. A very related um, uh, task conceptually is uh, batch correction and data harmonization. I talked about the batch effects earlier. And here, essentially what you're trying to do is to come up um, with a representation of your, of your data that has erased the technical effects that give rise to the, to the batch effects. There are different techniques by which you can do this. And here I just showcase three of them. You can take uh, advantage of a technique that is called uh, arithmetic operations on latent space, where basically what you can do is that you summarize the sources of variance as a latent vector. 
And then you can subtract this latent vector from your cells in order to remove different types of, of, uh, uh, of technical variants. So for example, if you have uh, two different subpopulations coming from two different uh, laboratories, you can summarize um, the, uh, the average profile of a laboratory in terms of, of its uh, um, latent profile, and then subtract this uh, in order to move the two, um, uh, your two data sets from the two, uh, coming from two different labs to the same space. You can also um, use um, um, one hot encoding in order to uh, uh, represent the origin of your different batches. And then basically by uh, shifting um, bits of this one hot bit encoding to move from one batch to the other. Another uh, technique uh, is to use conditional variation to encoders where basically the latent space representation is conditioned on different nuisance factors. Uh, for example, uh, one such nuisance factors can be the, the batch origin of your cells. Um, a very related uh, task conceptually is the multimodal data integration, where again, you try to harmonize data sets, but in this case, the data sets are not of the same uh, type. They are, uh, they are data where they you can measure different attributes of the data, different, you have different modalities. So for example, if you have gene expression data set, uh, ataxic data set, uh, chromosome accessibility data, uh, even imaging data. Uh, the cells are not necessarily paired in this experiment, and even the number of features can also be, uh, can be very different. But uh, the, the, the main concepts that you use in order to harmonize these data sets is basically very similar to what you use in terms of, of uh, batch correction, which is basically to try to bring your, um, uh, your data to uh, assert latent representation. Um, Again, because these models are end-to-end, -end, this allows for very efficient translation between domains, and it even allows you to predict what the output of a particular modality would be in a different modality where you have not seen a particular sample. So these are very powerful models in terms of inference. The final um, uh, task that I'm going to mention here is the automatic annotation of single cell data. So commonly a task that you face in single cell analysis is to try to annotate uh, the cells in terms of, of uh, the different subpopulations. And here I show one example that again uses conditional variation of the encoders, where apart from the nuisance factors that are encoded as a batch ID, you also encode uh, the cell type ID. And essentially, the later representation that, that you get back is conditioned on both the batch ID and the cell type ID. So this model can, at the same time, perform batch correction, but also uh, automatic classification because you can get very naturally from this model using the posterior of, uh, of your variational autoencoder, the cell type ID for a particular cell. Uh, um, I uh, have a final very interesting application of, of uh, 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 deep learning models on single cell data, which is uh, the out of distribution inference, which allows inspection of regions of the transcriptomic landscape that have not been visited. So what this allows you to do is to infer transcription, transcriptomes upon biological perturbations that have not been uh, observed uh, experimentally for all cells. Um, so you can, for example, infer the effects of the perturbations in different uh, tissue contexts that have not been assayed experimentally, or it allows you to infer uh, trajectories of cells that again have been uh, seen only for a subset of, of cell types. And on the bottom here, I saw uh, three different applications that actually do uh, exactly this out of distribution inference uh, on single cell data. There are several tasks that I, did, I do not have the time to talk about. Um, so for example, uh, the convolution of spatial transcriptomics, analysis of single cell ataxic data, doublet detection, analysis of site sick data, um, and so on. Um, and uh, again, this is a very uh, expanding field, rapidly expanding field. So it would be impossible to fit everything in the context of, of a half an hour talk. And uh, to finish up, I'd like to give you uh, some perspective of um, where the field is and where I think it's moving. 
So despite the multitude of publications on deep learning in the past four or five years, in single cell omics, the underlying principles that are used for most of the models are actually um, relatively few. And the, the, the architectures are also um, uh, quite uh, limited. The existing applications do not represent yet conceptual seeds, but rather provide alternative implementations to problems that already have existing counterparts um, uh, using different uh, algorithmic approaches. And also the performance shift that you see is also not uh, very spectacular yet, uh, leading many people to say that uh, using deep learning models for transcriptomics is like bringing uh, a gun to an, to a knife fight. Um, however, there are um, there are developments that um, um, prove the, that I think prove uh, many of these naysayers wrong. One of these examples is the uh, the, the use uh, in the past few years of geometric deep learning techniques, graph neural networks that allow the integration of existing biological knowledge in the network's inductive bias and give rise to sparser network with more accurate representation. Another uh, example of, of uh, an opportunity that cannot be tackled with traditional machine learning techniques is the modeling of uh, uh, um, molecular perturbations. So large scale perturbation atlases that are being generated these years combined with the representation capacity of uh, deep generative networks, they hold the promise of, of um, producing more comprehensive mapping out of the regulatory states of the cells, which means that um, uh, it should be possible to perform perturbation response prediction, target and mechanism prediction, and prediction of comp combinatorial perturbation effects, which is one of the holy grails of, of uh, uh, transcriptomics uh, since many decades now. I leave you with a quote for, uh, from a recent paper of a lab that has done um, uh, tons of work on single cell transcriptomics, the lab of Fabian Tiles. And this quote is that uh, it comes from an evaluation of different classification methods and comparison with, uh, with deep learning techniques. And they conclude that um, after performing this comparison, we are still waiting for the ImageNet moment in single cell genomics. That means that we are still awaiting for this transformative moment where uh, an application will present um, a, a conceptual shift or show a performance that shows no comparison to any other um, traditional machine learning methodology. And I think this method is coming given the, the um, uh, uh, complexity of, of uh, data sets, uh, the rising complexity of, of data sets that are being generated and also the complexity of the questions that biologists are asking when they look at uh, transcriptomic data. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>